There we go. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say thanks to folks who are watching and listening, whatever, you know, wherever you are, whatever platform, we appreciate you being here. I've been looking forward to this interview and I feel really bad because it's the one only ever I had to cancel a week ago because of how I was feeling, the COVID calamity, COVID blues, but my guest is very generous and understanding and accommodating and uh, man, when I look at the body of work he's done, the history, the people he's worked with, the things he's put out on his own as with his brother and I'm just really excited to have my guest with me. His name is Pete Levin. And Pete, thanks so much for being with me today. So happy to happy to be with you. Really Glad good to be with you. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's you know these days, it's a little scary. You know, you start to worry a little differently. And uh, I'm in generally overall, you know, good health, but I do have a couple underlying conditions that could be potentially uh, made a lot worse by COVID, but. I didn't happen during my time with COVID yet, and I think I'll be okay. So I'm going to get through. These days of paranoia, if you sneeze more than twice in a row, that's it. Grab a thermometer, call the doctor. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, pardon me. So anyways, uh, yeah, you know, I was telling you, but, but before we uh, went on camera here and recorded, I was telling Pete, um, I've, wanted, I've wanted to get out to a gig or more than one, because I used to work down in your area, uh, you know, between, let's say, Albany and probably the Mohawk or Newburgh's about as far south as I went. And then the next step was New York City. Not a lot, but here and there. And it just never worked out where I was able to get out to see you live. But I've certainly heard you so many things you've done. Uh, I really respect you, uh, the work you've done. And it's just, I can't wait to talk about it. How are you? You're doing all right, though. Everything's cool. You're near Kingston, right? New York? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Woodstock area, and the Kingston, Woodstock area. And we're hanging in. Good. Uh, that's it. It's, uh, it's tricky asking a musician how they're doing these days. But, uh, yeah. They're cooking a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so when I have these conversations, a lot of times I go off on tangents, but just one thing is my sense of smell went away completely. Still, it's gone with uh, COVID, but my appetite and my sense of taste did not go away, unfortunately. So <laughs> it's been really easy to put on a few pounds, and I did, you know, but it'll go away because I'll make it go away. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting point because Oh man, I, I know you probably know way more musicians than I do who have been affected by this in one way or another or multiple ways. And I mean, some people are really hurting too. Like touring was their thing. And there are no gigs or gigging was their thing. You know, even if it's like here, a local band, you know, doing weddings and parties and this and that, there not as many weddings happening or there have been virtual weddings. So the income that income is gone from, from exactly how it used to be. Some people have gone virtual and done things. Others are doing other things. It's been a tough time for musicians and a lot of other people. It is. Uh, it's the, uh, I was playing live outdoors like a fair amount last year. Uh, it got reduced to you know, restaurants, local restaurants so far that were doing things on their patio, doing mm -hmm. it successfully even. You know, by the beginning of November, it was just too cold. You know, even, even if the band was willing to give it a shot, uh, but, you know, who wants to sit there on a metal chair and a metal table eating a fifty-dollar dinner? Uh, so it, it just it all stopped. And, yeah. uh, I, I looked, and my next gig on the calendar was April twenty-fifth, wow. uh, a Sunday, uh, at a wonderful club in Marlboro, New York. I. Uh, and I, I emailed the owner about two weeks ago because I said he started up, he's got stuff going on. And, and I, I asked him, yeah, you know, I just had a straight thought, you know, we're part of a Sunday series that you were always doing. Uh, I haven't seen any bands playing on the Sundays. Are you going to be doing that? So, oh, no, 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 that's canceled. So, oh, so that's it. I have a wide open calendar for, uh, for 2021. Oh, wow, man. Yeah, that's, 
It's sad. It's but really sad. No, that, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Our, our, our fear is that, uh, well, most music right now there there are, there just are no, there's nothing out there at all, uh, ex except recording at home, exchanging files. I'm doing a lot of that, and mm -hmm. other people I know are doing that. Uh, you know, create a piano track or an organ or something for, you know, for somebody who's working on an album at home, it could be anywhere in the world. Uh, but playing live, uh, you know, that's what we do. Uh, you know, retirement is not a, uh, it's just not something you factor in. Musicians don't. It's, uh, you, know, you keep playing, you keep performing until you physically can't do it anymore. Or like one of my favorite little quotes comes from Louis Armstrong. Uh, when you're dead, you're done. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's it. But, and it, uh, so many musicians I know have found themselves into a forced retirement situation, which is depressing, yeah. uh, more depressing because there's no money coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. But just the fact that you can't, that you can't play, that you're not seeing other musicians, and there's none of that interface, our chops all get, get stale. Uh, it's, it's not good. It'll come back at some point. Or, yeah. Or, it, we, we all have high hopes for this year. Uh, the, the reality is in this country until at least 50% of the population is vaccinated. It's going to be very tricky, you know, uh, yeah. going out into, into venues, traveling, getting on an airplane. No way. I mean, I, that's going to be a long time before I'll do that. So, so international travel, I don't see that happening before next year, frankly. Right. It's, yeah, I don't either. Course, yeah. So, well, at least and, for the yeah. music world, I'd say. And, and personally, I'm not going to go anywhere either. <laughs> I was a little worried about it. Yeah. Of course, I can't now because I tested positive this week again. Right, we'll see what happens. But oh. um, but it's it's um, you know. So we were talking. You know Adam Nussbaum. Very well. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, was, such a, what a great guy. Love him. I love him. We were talking recently. He's uh, the last thing he said. He said Carl, stay positive and test negative. So <laughs> he was he was on a thing yesterday. And uh, I was talking with Peter Erskine, and I told him that. And uh, Peter says, "So I guess did you 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 was trying to stay positive, but you tested positive? Well, you could be negative and test positive. It was just silly, but yeah, great words of wisdom. Another little thing: stay positive and test negative. But Adam is like, he talks like a bobster. Yeah, it is, yeah it's great. I love it, man. It's just part of his character. It's him. Uh, he's." added a few words and phrases to the language that I find myself using groovulating groovulating. I love that. That's <laughs> or, great. You know, uh, let's get in groovulating. That's oh, it. <laughs> I love it. So much fun to talk with him. Uh, he's, he's a great player. He's got, uh, I, know, I know we'll talk eventually about my years with Gil Evans, but Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. I had, I can't point out to a single favorite uh, in any place in the band, but one of my favorite rhythm sections with that band was uh, with Adam Nussbaum and Mark Egan. Oh uh, yeah, sure. We're doing it together. Yeah, and it was there was a creative thing happening. There was always something brewing. It was always developing and turning mm -hmm. into something else. Uh, which most of the time was okay with Gil. Sometimes it wasn't, uh, mm -hmm. but it was exciting. All always, you know, yeah. Every every gig, no matter how small, how big the gig was, no matter what we were playing, it was like you never knew what we were going to get into. We'd be playing a ballad, and all of a sudden, Adam would start a reggae beat, just uh -huh. out of nowhere. It had nothing to do with anything. Mark would join him, and suddenly the whole band is faking reggae. You know, for a chart that had nothing whatsoever to do with that, and it was kind of like that. Anyway, that, that, that's that's Adam. that's we love, we love him. Yeah, you know, I, I've loved his playing for decades. I mean, it, it's interesting too because we're where you're located, Kingston, New York area, is near Woodstock, and then uh, you have a pretty high concentration of serious musical talent living there. Where Adam, um, Adam is is Easton, Pennsylvania. 
also a lot of talent right there and not, not really working there, but living there and going out elsewhere. Typically, you know, Jeff Watts, Gene Perla, uh, Hal Galper, I think was living there, the piano guy. Uh, it's, yep. yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, these communities that have such great talent altogether. So, you know, while we're talking about, why don't we, I wanted to ask you about Gil Evans. This might be a great time. We don't have to go in any particular order. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I first became uh, familiar with Gil and his existence. Uh, probably as a late bloomer, I, I was all big band stuff until I was 12. I'm going to be 60. So 1973, my English teacher said, you got to check out Billy Cobham and Chick Corea and John McLaughlin. And well, that was a pathway for me, but it was another four or five years when I looked into their history of people they worked with in common. Well, Miles Davis comes up all the time. Right. And so got sketches of Spain and that was my first Gil Evans experience. And uh, I loved it then. I especially love it now because I, my ear is, better trained to hear things and understand things but then you know i hear gill through the years doing various things i think maybe danny gottlieb worked with gill too didn't he i think yep uh gottlieb, adam danny came into the band right after adam okay right, right after adam left and it was were uh, you together with danny in that band was he part of like when you were with gill oh yeah, yeah. oh wow uh Danny and I go way, way back into the 70s. Uh, uh, we played in many different situations uh, together, been in the studio a lot together, and he, and he was with Gil for, for, for several years. Uh, uh, that uh, was also uh, with Mark Egan playing bass. Oh. Uh, but also a great rhythm section. It was different than Adam. It was uh, Danny's approach to playing is not the same as Adam. He's not as aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, he and Mark go back even farther than with me. Yeah, they're like Danny and Mark are like they're like one mind. They're, they're like they're like this. They are. They're just, yeah. It's it's like you, it's like it's like you planned it out, and they're just right there and right on top of it together. That was, uh, I guess, my favorite. The last one was my favorite. I don't know. It was a favorite rhythm section with uh, with Gil. Uh, well, I, I never had one. There was never one I didn't like, but that was very special in its own way. And that's great. So I'm curious, uh, you know, I don't usually ask this question, what was it like, you know, that one, but, but I will ask, what was it like? What was your experience like working with Gil? I, I'd love to hear about it because how did you first meet up with Gil? How did this, how did it all come about? And then you had what, 15 or so years with him? Yeah, 16. 16. Okay. You're stacked. You're stacking up questions. <laughs> it's got that complex oh, I answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was, I, I was a French horn player in college uh, in the the '60s. Uh, I was a French horn major in Boston. Okay. Uh, I did, came to New York, went to Juilliard, did a master's degree in French horn, uh, and it was in the early '70s. Uh, I'd left town and come back. The early '70s, I was getting into studio work. Uh, I had a lot of friends in the jazz, the jazz field, and I was playing in clubs. I always played piano to some extent mm -hmm. and banjo. That's another cool. story. Maybe I won't tell that one. That's uh, cool though. That's great. I, I remember I had come back from, uh, uh, I'd done a session for somebody and I got back to my apartment, I think early evening, uh, six or seven o'clock, maybe something like that. I remember because it was a Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, uh, wait, no. Tuesday. It was okay. a Tuesday. All right. <laughs> you can edit that, right? Never mind. Uh, it's the reason why I remember. But I I got in. I was starting to uh, get something to eat together. I had a call from Howard Johnson. Oh, yeah. Uh, Who just passed. Old friend of mine. Yeah. Just passed. Yeah. Like a month big, ago or something. Yeah. Big, big, big loss for me. But uh, oh. uh, Howard... Uh, incredible musician tuba player primarily uh howard called me he said pete what are you doing i said well i you know i just got back i'm going to make supper he said you got your horn well sure yeah so get down to the village vanguard like now <laughs> well I said, can i eat dinner I said no get over here now 
So, so I walked in and uh, uh, Gil Evans was booked Tuesday through Sunday mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the Vanguard. The 70s, it was an interesting period. I, I'm repeating a, a story I've told several times or, or an impression perhaps. The 70s was a lousy decade for music. Mm -hmm. uh, every time, everything was disco. Yeah, I was doing a lot of sessions. Every other session was disco. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm on hits. Don't get me started. Jingles, commercials, sometimes two a day. Disco. Uh -huh. They used to hire two two drummers. One mm -hmm. drummer would just play the groove. Another drummer would just be doing the hi hat. Really? Oh wow! Really? And that would you know the rhythm section would be in and out in fifteen minutes, and that's it. Uh, that was the seventies. There was some mm -hmm. jazz going on, fusion was not for purists mm -hmm. but it was a great decade for musicians everybody was working uh, broadway was was rocking uh clubs in the village and all over all over new york city were all doing music seven nights a week mm -hmm. uh, i was literally doing two sometimes three recording sessions a day mm -hmm. uh, just walking around new york because all this most of the studios were in midtown and uh, within walking distance. Wow. Uh, so extending it, here we are, the Village Vanguard, Tuesday night. Uh, the French horn player had come in from New Jersey, where he lived. Uh, he got to the Vanguard, he opened his case, and he'd forgotten his mouthpiece. And he, he was looking at, you know what, I got a lot of work. I really didn't want to do this anyway. They'd be schlepping back into town, you know, to play to one in the morning. I'm going home. And and that and that was it. He just he just walked. He quit the band right there. Wow. Uh, okay. And Howard called and said, "Get down here." And I uh, I went into the Vanguard. I played the week with Gil, and I was in the band for sixteen years. Gee, that's there. that's pretty cool. It's that's, great. It's great. That's story. great. I, and it, I was late getting there. They had already uh, set up, and they had. Uh, it's a very small stage. And it was yeah, a big it band. Like, I've only been there 13, a couple times, but yeah. And the, I'm small. sorry, the band was how many pieces in the band? Uh, 13, 14, perhaps, or okay. some, something, something. Well, that's so a lot to fit on that stage. That. And they, yeah. they'd left a space yeah. on the stage. Uh, uh, they knew somebody else was coming in, a horn player was coming in. So they left a, a chair and a stand and a small space for me. <laughs> but they all kind of maneuvered. Uh, uh, because nobody wanted to sit next to the drums. Okay. So that's the spot that they left for me. So I, I come, I come walking in and said, wow, Gil, Gil Evans. Wow. We shook hands. We met, uh, and sit over there. There's the book. And I sat and like right over my head was the biggest ride symbol I ever saw in my life. Like, <laughs> right over my head. That's it. Two long sets, you know, till two in the morning at mm -hmm. the village Vanguard. Yeah. Uh, with my ears ringing. Uh, it was it was great. What can I say? And uh, uh, extra bonus uh, on the other side of that ride symbol was uh, uh, my good friend Lenny White. Oh uh, wow! He was cool. playing. He was playing with Gil at the time. Uh, I I met him there in 1973, and oh, we've been great friends ever since. And, wow, that's great. Uh, you know that's around the this is the, by the way people i'm really sorry and peter i'm sorry for my kleenex it's just the COVID stuff going on is, uh, my eyes I'm gonna have to I'm, I'm, i actually feel quite good right now i just uh have some things going on but so this is a complete detour but i want to get back to gill i the first time i actually the only time that's right the only time i ever saw lenny white i was i think i was 13. Because uh, my English teacher took uh, my best friend, who's still my best friend, and me to see them at a college here in Syracuse. And uh, he was with Return of Forever. It was, maybe it was 74, but L.D. Miola had just joined the band. Now, I've been, you know, following Lenny for, since then. But I, I really want to see him perform again someday. I haven't, you know. But anyways, that's really cool. So I didn't realize he worked with Gil. That's cool. He did. I uh, uh, chick. Uh, and return for forever were, were very busy at the time and it they were very very successful i mean a lot of money yeah uh, so obviously that that's where lenny's obligation was mm -hmm. uh, but he loved gill he loved playing with gill uh, 
that it was great. a it was a the band went through different periods uh, it was uh, more straight ahead then uh, uh which was that that's where lenny's roots are you know, come, you know, coming from miles uh, right right yeah that's I, get, cool. I could see what we were going talking to you we'll be talking about drummers a lot but uh, i wouldn't presume to pick a favorite drummer but i have so many oh uh, i do too i do too it's it's it's, it's great the different drummers you know lenny the way he can be progressive and traditional at the same time and an, an innovator he's an innovator he is. adam his energy boundless energy he could drive a band like nobody have ever played with mm -hmm. uh, danny gottlieb has got a unique talent for making things work mm -hmm. whatever you're doing whatever situation he walks into he just he picks up his sticks and he makes it work. Yeah, that that's it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, uh, we'll we'll do more. Uh, Jeff Siegel, not so well known. We'll we'll talk about him, but he uh, he lives near me, and uh, we played together quite a bit. We toured together with with my brother. And, oh, uh, that's it. yeah, I I, re I know Jeff's name. I'm not familiar with his work at all. But uh, and you know, it's interesting is. You know, I'm a drummer. I went to school for music. I, I don't really remember much about theory or anything like that because I just never. Now I wish I did, but it's OK. Uh, drums, I understand, but I understand other things, too, in my own way. And, and what's interesting is some of the best lessons I've had about drums come from non drummers. Because we'll talk about space. We'll talk about phrasing and dynamics. Space is a big one, though. And then probably the biggest one that changed how I looked and approached things was, uh, I don't know if you know David Castiglione. Well, he knows Tony. He's a, a, a saxophonist. Yes, I do. I know. I haven't seen him in a long time. But... Yeah, he's he's living not too far from me. I, he bought a, he and his, oh, he got married. He, his, they bought a house on Cross Lake, I think. So uh, I'd love to see him again. We used to do, well, tenor sax and my little slingling kit drum and sax duos and it was a blast but he taught me about intention you know what's the intention behind what you're playing what do you want people to feel what do you want people to hear what do you want to say and it took a long time for that to click in but that made a huge difference and so it's i really have enjoyed conversations for, with with so many great musicians, drummers or not, because I always learn things. But you know, I, the, you know how it is. Your perspective can change. It's like, oh my gosh, I never thought of that. How could I not? But that's the beauty of it. You can always keep learning. So, I learned a lot uh, 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 drums, uh, studying drums. Uh, Lenny was uh, the seventies and eighties was doing a lot of producing of R and B. R&B tracks, singers mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think the jazz community came down on him a little bit for that because he, uh, in, in some odd ways, he. Uh, I don't believe he gets the recognition that he really deserves because he's done a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but we worked. Uh, I was. I had gotten long since had gotten into synthesizers and computer programming. Uh, and I was uh, his programmer or his keyboard guy on a lot of projects mm -hmm. uh, studio for three or four weeks working on an album. Uh, a lot of them great albums. Uh, it, it for me, it was a uh, uh, Lenny didn't play live on any of the program drums. Sometime mm -hmm. I would program some of the drums under his supervision. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if I did some jive, he'd let me know right away. <laughs> uh, Sure. Uh, but it was, it was an interesting study of of uh, uh, how to put the elements of a drum kit together, how to vary them, uh, and how that might apply to different drummers in different situations. Uh, uh, I think the the first major uh, trick trick I was a trick but, uh, that I learned. Uh, was it cut all the uh, all the elements uh, they're all samples all the all the elements of the drum kit were separate mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned that uh, if tune felt it's a little bit too much on top, I'd take the snare and just sit it, sit it a little bit in the back of the beat. I'm going to talk mm -hmm. milliseconds. Change right. the feel of the it was wonderful. It was like, yeah. wow. I learned that from Lenny. So he's oh. a, uh, yeah. he is a, uh, Lenny is a student of music and of people and of life. Incredible guy. Okay. Have you ever met him? You should interview him. So. I, I would love to talk with Lenny. I really That's would. Smart. That would be uh, an honor to talk with him as well. I, I don't, uh, well, typically what I do <laughs> As I just send people a note that's, you know, dear so-and-so, because I, I just re respect the music I've heard from you. I love what you've done. Uh, to me, the like, you know, with, with Lenny, it would be the same thing. It is with you is, look at all you've done. You're a very versatile musician, and it's just amazing to me. I, I'm so... I used to joke that I, I don't remember doing half this stuff. <laughs> I don't remember what I have. That's not true. Not true. <laughs> but these days, I don't remember where I was last week. But, but that's another well, story. But, but memory it's, is you know, it's, it's a learning process. Uh, all of it is. What I was just describing, working with Lenny. Uh, again, backpedaling a little bit. Uh, you know, I have, a, I have a music degree from Boston University, two from Juilliard. Uh, you know, I studied you know, great great professors great people mm -hmm. uh next to some some musicians at juilliard who were in the class with me incredible people that mm -hmm. uh, have gone on the famous the famous now in mm -hmm. the classical world mm -hmm. uh, i was the jazz interloper there I, I i think uh but i got out and i uh, you know, i was puttering around new york and starting to earn a living and doing okay with it uh and then uh I ended up in the Gil Evans Orchestra, which I regarded as starting over. Uh, right. It's like right. I went to the school of Gil Evans for 16 years. Uh, that, we, that was my know, graduate. That was and, my and doctor. I, I'm, inter I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry, but that to me is almost like, uh, well, I remember this is like 40 years ago. I saw Tom Breckline, the drummer with Chick Corea. And uh, it was it was amazing. I had a really good seat too because it was a very small place. So I'm right in the front. I was just feet from Chick, and but that's beside the point. The thing is, I was able to talk with Tom afterwards. And he was telling me that working with Chick was like being in a university, uh, except it was better because it was real life experience of of all kinds. You know, interacting, rehearsing, yeah. touring, learning, reading, interpreting, and you know when I look at Gil Evans and all that he did, it couldn't not be a university. Right, I mean, there had to be an incredible learning experience and development and everything. It was uh, from Gil, obviously, and, and from the people around me. Uh, you know, they were all my own age, but you know, I'd taken a different path to get to that spot, to that gig at the Vanguard. And you know, I'm sending the people around me: uh, Johnny Coles, Howard Johnson, uh, uh, Billy Harper. I, I think Lenny oh, White. Yeah. Herb Bushler was playing bass. Uh, Sue Evans was playing percussion. Uh, later on, Bruce Ditmas came into the band. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Trevor Kohler, who passed away, amazing sax player. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Dave Bargeron, uh, a tremendous low brass player, trombone and tuba player. Uh, Ted Dunbar. And if everyone oh, I meant, yeah. Amazing. I'm amazing guitar player mm -hmm. uh, and it was just all these guys just you know just sitting there there you know, playing gill's book wow and and gill was uh he wasn't into grooves or pockets so much uh everything was textures mm -hmm. for him uh the way he used instruments the way he put us together and he was constantly trying things there was some uh some charts that i played with the band through the my entire stay with the band uh several from the porgy and bess album he did with, oh. with miles david yeah uh, one of them was gone uh, oh yeah sure. which is uh, it's known to jazz musicians uh, it's an obscure part of the of the opera mm -hmm. but not a hit was is an understatement in fact uh, gill had an argument once with a 
of, we recorded it again from from the album, and they went to report it to uh, uh, to the publish to Gershwin's publishers. They said, "Where's this gone? We don't have that." He said, "Yes, you do. It's a, it's in Porgy and Bess. No, it isn't. It is really." I said, no, it isn't. We never heard of it. So I said, okay, so Gil put his name on it. So, <laughs> uh, it, it is. It's yeah. a, uh, anyway, he, would, he was rewriting that chart uh, for years. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like every year or so, a, a different version of the chart would uh, it would just appear on our stands in, in, in the book. Uh, you know, different voicings, trying stuff. Uh, I don't think it was the first week in the Vanguard, but it was a one of our weekly stints at the at, in the vanguard i remember i was still playing french horn this before i switched to synthesizer uh it was a piece that we were playing i can't remember the name of it it was seven bars long that's it and it just repeated and he mm -hmm. would cue our sections or musicians to do things mm -hmm. and uh I don't remember which trumpet player at the time, but the, I think it was written from Miles. Uh, but a trumpet player would just solo over the whole thing, just mm -hmm. constantly. There was no beginning, no end. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very slow. Uh, mm -hmm. So seven measures, seven whole notes. Mm -hmm. uh, it Gill wanted wanted tension, so he said mm -hmm. occasionally he would cue the brass to play it, play it three or four times, and then stop, and then. It was open to the rhythm section or whatever happened and EQ again. He wanted more tension. He, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the title is escaping me, but the title had to do with the intention or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. And yeah. went, so the trumpet plays solo and he leans over to us. Uh, uh, this is the trumpets and the horns and the trombones. Uh, there were maybe six or seven brass maybe eight eight or nine wind players that, that was it turns to everybody i said play it up an octave just everybody just play it up an octave uh, uh this put uh the trumpet player uh put them all above the staff way above the staff and staying there wow. uh it it might the tempo is like it's like a one two three four Breathe another one. Yeah, I was gonna say you have to have some yeah. good good lungs, right? <laughs> I mean, the trumpet players were turning red and like almost passing out. <laughs> uh, you know, guys were dropping notes all over the. But you can't do that. Nobody. You, long note. Your drummer. You don't know, but long notes. Playing slow is hard. Way harder than playing fast. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. Of wind players, uh, but yes, with a lot of clams. Uh, but he got the tension that he wanted. So he was happy. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about that after. Man, that's there. There's a lesson right there in orchestrating. Yeah. Uh, how you put instruments together, what you tell them to do, and how to do it. Uh, it that creates a sound. It creates a texture. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gill is famous for those textures. Like he, he's got like a an 18 piece band with a flute playing the lead. Mm -hmm. and, and doubled in, with a muted trumpet maybe while mm -hmm. other guys are, are wailing away it was just down you do that i want to hear the flute and the trumpet that's one of his signature sounds from sketches of spain yeah and, and yeah definitely things. so there was a every every gig every gig for 16 years i learned from See, that's fantastic you know it's interesting about textures that's a thing that later you know years before i stopped playing I, I'll reemerge at some point in some way uh, with music, but for the past seven years, I haven't done anything music, uh, live gigs. But you know, those last years, especially with Dave helping me out, Dave Castiglione, and teaching me, and textures became a real important concept in my mind. And and a lot of that for me as a drummer had to do with the symbols I was using. You know, drums too, but symbols. It can kind of make it or break it. And then Adam Nussbaum was, we were talking about this, about the, the balance and the flow. If you want flow, what kind of flow do you want? And what kind of textures do you want? What kind of uh, 
you know, symbols are so, it's all important. And then how you strike the symbol and where you strike it, what part of the stick, but textures, it's something I didn't really even think about until I was maybe 45 years old, you know, 15 years ago, maybe. And then it helped me to identify when other players were maybe thinking about textures, right? Because the way they play, the way they swipe the symbol or, you know, Paul Wertico and, and, uh, sure. uh, who was I watching? I was just watching the other day. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't remember, but it's, that's interesting. So, and, and another side note, my mom's instrument is French horn. Uh, she grew up in Westfield, New Jersey. She was always in all state, uh, and all this and that, and went to Ithaca college, graduated there. Um, excellent classical pianist and vocalist as well but french horn is near and dear to all of our hearts because of her so um wh when did you how, how many years were you doing the french horn with for about how long and then you switched would you switch solely or exclusively to synth or keyboards how did that work i i'd been messing with synthesizers since the early 70s mm -hmm. uh i my first the first instrument that I owned was a mini Moog. In fact, uh, can you see it? It's over, over the shoulder. Right I, in the I back. think I see the one with the knobs on it up there to the it, left of that picture. This guy is a Moog one. Okay. That's, uh, that's Moog's latest flagship instrument. Oh, wow. Way in back of it. Mm -hmm. okay, this I've had for about a year. Uh, way, way in back of it. That's, that's my 1973 mini Moog. I, I love that. That's great. Startled when I see how much those things are selling for on eBay. <laughs> I, not that one, but they're going to bury me with this. <laughs> this yeah. will resell, but not no, the mini mode. Huh? But that, but I got it. I got it in the in the uh, with the early seventies. Mm -hmm. Gill's band. Uh, it was a band full of soloists. I mean, every song would last 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. But easily, uh, because there were so many strong soloists in the band, and everybody had to play. Uh, it sometimes somebody would object. Uh, I don't know if you ran, ran across Herb Bushler. Uh, yes. uh, they're a tremendous bass player. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he somewhat got out of the jazz scene at one point and got into. Uh, heavy recording and contracting in New York City, but it's a great bass player. Played with Gil for a long time. Uh, it, you know, Gil would call it to him. We play the head. Somebody would stand up and solo. Then another guy. Then another guy. And there'd be like six, seven solos. Uh, and like you know, the bass and drums just got to keep going through the whole thing. And like mm -hmm. when do we get a shot? Never. You're just <laughs> you're waiting for the you know, uh, you know, yeah, so you can stop and uh, and drink your beer. Uh, it was one of the, one of those nights. I, uh, I, uh, whatever song we were playing, from the the stuff that sticks in your head. I, uh, I, uh, it started. Howard Johnson took took a tuba solo. <clears throat> then there was a, uh, a trumpet. A couple of sax players, probably ten Dunbar solo. It just went around. It came around the same tune. Man. It's going. You know, fifteen twenty minutes. It got back around again. Howard picked up a flugelhorn and threw up and took another solo. And, <laughs> and, and yeah, Bushler went through the ceiling. He started yelling at him that he stopped playing. Uh, and Gil, of course, was oblivious to him. No bass, different texture. And yeah, he was exactly. finer. And Gil would be sitting at the at the Fender Roads you know, like this. He was he was just he was just loving the whole thing. Like wow, uh, it, was, it was such a great great band and you know, for me i'd always come back to learning mm -hmm. of just learning from the guys around me gill sure, hired sure. musicians for that band because he liked the way he, they played mm -hmm. they, they did something interesting that he really liked uh so, would so not I'm... necessarily mm -hmm. be a good choice to fill a chair in a big band mm -hmm. it, it was not a conventional big band right. uh but if Gil liked what you were doing with your instrument, you're in the band. You know, find a book. There was one tour we did. Uh, Europe. Uh, 
the band was a little bit bigger than uh, than usual. I think we'd picked up some players in Europe to join us, but the sax section was uh, Dave Sanborn, Steve Lacey, whoa, uh, uh, Arthur Blythe, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Billy Harper, and Howard Johnson playing baritone. No kidding. Uh, talk about five guys with no chance whatsoever of blending as a sax section. I mean, mm-hmm. none. It didn't. It didn't matter. It was magic. One of them would stand up, and the whole character of the piece would change, and they'd solo. And, that's amazing. Uh, that's that. Would, that was Gil. That's uh, for me. I'm, I'm sorry, I got off the mark. But the no, that's totally fine. Songs, songs lasted for a long time because there were so many soloists. Mm-hmm. Uh, it uh, it took me. It was quite a while before I. I got my nerve up enough to stand up and take a solo in one of these bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it was maybe the third week we played at the Village Vanguard, and it was like every night, finally the last night, Sunday night, everybody put up a Pete, stand up, take a solo. And I did. I was I peed my pants. I did the best I could. I, I just sat down and thought, damn, I'm never going to do that again. And to, and Gil's wife came up to me afterwards. Oh, it was magic! It was magic! It was beautiful! Oh, leave me alone! I gotta go! I got I gotta pee. Uh, <laughs> so normally I would, you know, excuse me. We played ahead. I was just sit there, you know, twiddling my thumbs for twenty minutes, and then play the outhead, maybe a backup course, an ensemble course, if it was mm-hmm. one. Uh, and I told Gil about this mini mode that I've been messing with at home. Uh, and I brought it by his apartment to show it to him. He said, no, oh, bring it to the gig. Said, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But uh, I said, well, do some stuff with it. Yeah. I took a couple of solos on it because, uh, you know, everybody was uh, was all excited over when Hammer was doing with me all the time. And, uh, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, used, I took some solos and I started you know, improvising parts, ensembles, and I would just add this voice to it. Sometimes you know an octave above where anybody could play, or mm-hmm. or low, or you know, stuff like that. And he loved it. He said, "Do more of that. Do more of that." I said, "Well, I got to, you know, I got to get back to my horns." No, don't do that. And he hired another horn player <laughs> to to take care of that book because I couldn't get back to my horn. And, Excuse me. Uh, wow. And I just stopped bringing the horn to gigs. I uh, and later I I started bringing a mini moog and a clavinet. Oh, great. I, I turned into an electric keyboard player in the mm-hmm. band. That's, I, that's really cool. And I, I, I still think it over and over again. How many band leaders have you ever worked with that would let you do something like that? Just completely oh. change instruments. I'm not going to play as, I'm not going to play this anymore. I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, yeah, I, that's I, just, I you know, that's really cool because this the spirit of experimenting with sounds and textures and all that is obviously that was a big deal to him and it in a way it helped to define what he did too you know this oh that's gill you can tell by a lot of different methods but or or different means but uh i I love that spirit of experimenting too though over the course of the 70s the band became a hybrid electric acoustic Mm -hmm. like when we recorded the uh uh, the Jimi Hendrix album in 1976, uh, five of us in the room, I was still playing horn, but five of us in the room had mini mogs next to us. Mm-hmm. And we're just, oh, yeah, you weren't playing your horn, you reach over the mini moog and do something, make a noise, uh, relevant or not. You would be kept in the mix or left out of the mix. We never knew, and nobody yeah. remembered. But uh, one of the percussionists, didn't play keyboard at all, but he had when he was playing on the Minimo keyboard with mallets, with drum oh. mallets. Oh, and wow. During a break, I went over and I looked at his Minimo. The keys were all, a couple of them were busted and they were all up, up and down like this. <laughs> uh, so. Wow. Yeah, you you have, uh, you did a lot with recording wise. It's a lot with Gil here. Um, Royal Festival Hall, London, 1978. I was actually there a couple of years ago with that, uh, that hall for something else, but that's, uh, that's, I have that. I also have that was uh, memorable, memorable night. Almost anything you bring up, I'm going to have stories. So you, know, you got to limit me or we'll, 
we'll, okay. you, you run out of tape. Uh, no there problem. was a memorable night in many ways. I have the uh, Live of Sweet Basil Volume 1. I, have. I don't have two, but I have the Umbria Jazz too. Um, which that was later though. Well, actually, so when was Live at Umbria Jazz recorded? Because I don't think it was released till around 2000, something like that. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, we played there many times mm -hmm. uh, in Perugia. And they recorded everything. Oh, and, okay. You know, we, we come back the next year and there'd be a live album of us. And it was like, really? Oh, uh, yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, I don't think I got my check from that yet. Uh, <laughs> so I honestly don't know. There was a, 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 it was the festival itself that was recording. I mean, they would just you know, manufacture albums from it. And, uh, I guess everything was so loose. Nobody was keeping track of anything. Yeah. Uh, you might, uh, people have helped me with my discography and I added stuff, but uh, there's a long list of albums, uh, Gil Evans albums that I'm on where the band didn't know we were being recorded. I see. Yeah. Okay. That's almost like they were great, leg, but maybe not. I, yeah. 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 yeah we, we were some, some bootlegging jazzers. Uh, well, uh, you, you know, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I'm curious. Uh, you know, Howard Johnson is another person that uh, years ago, I can't remember the circumstances of why he and I were communicating, but I think it was something similar. I was going to be close, a few blocks from him where he was going to be playing. And uh, he, I mean, he wouldn't, he didn't know me, of course, but we had a friend in common. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, Jeff Stockham, trumpet player. He's here in Syracuse. Jeff Stockham was real good friends with Howard for a long time. And they worked together. He was in the, I think the TS Monk group as well. Jeff was, and just one of the greatest trumpet players I ever had the pleasure of working with. But anyways, uh, it, Howard's, it's, it's, it's well, my chair's going here. Okay, there we go. So <laughs> uh, Howard just seems like he's so, was so well-rounded and talented. And uh, I mean, just from what you told me, because I didn't know this, I didn't know that he would play flugelhorn and baritone sax. So, and tuba, of course, what he's known for, but most known for. But I mean, you got to know him very well, right? I did, I did. Uh, yeah. There was a period when I uh, uh, started in Boston, but I, I was kind of working my way through college playing banjo uh, in these nightclubs. Uh, there was a nightclub, the Red Garter, mm -hmm. uh, which the name got changed to your father's mustache. And I was playing in their club in Boston, came to New York. I, 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 I was just starting to meet people. Mm -hmm. uh, I just needed to work. Uh, your father's mustache had had a uh, had a big club on Seventh Avenue South, uh, and I walked right into a six night a week job playing a banjo. Uh, it was fun. It was goofy. Uh, uh, Howard was in that circle. He didn't. He, uh, he played there some. Uh, it wasn't his favorite thing. He was doing a lot of jazz. And, and, uh, the the banjo bands it was a three banjos tuba trombone and washboard oh no kidding wow. uh, loud rackety you you got it. i don't think we played anything written after 1930 uh, <laughs> but i learned a lot of very obscure old songs sure uh, banjos not uh, strumming just playing rhythm banjos not hard i, I picked it up very quickly mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I'd got to know Howard in the period. Uh, he uh, he got me in as a sub a couple. I had been playing tuba some uh, mm. with, with that band also. I uh, I played tuba in college in, in addition to French horn. So he actually uh, got used me as a sub a couple and one with Mingus. Well, wow, that was oh uh, no kidding! Wow, yeah, that was that was early seventy. That, yeah, that was over my head, but. It, uh, I didn't get it at the time. I, I do now. Mm -hmm. and I, I, wow. Uh, but uh, with Howard, uh, 
as I think back, he got me maybe my two best gigs that I've ever done. I've, I've done a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, he hooked me up with Paul Simon. Oh, wow. Uh, and I toured, toured with Paul for the better part of a year mm -hmm. uh, this, in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And he he was the one who called and said, get down to the Vanguard now. <laughs> and yeah, he, uh, right, that, right. I was in 16 years with Gil. So it had, I uh, learned a lot, you know, from from both from both those gigs. Different things, but learned. Right. Um, I have to make an adjustment here, real quick. Gonna, sure. I'll, I'll pause the thing and. Uh... <clears throat> oh, this is perfect. Okay, uh, I'll just edit that out. So, <laughs> yeah, this is actually better, anyways, for me for my posture. So, let's see. I was thinking about. David Sanborn. So, uh, so that saxophone play uh, section you mentioned, Arthur Blythe Sanborn. Um, forget the other ones, but what a section! Steve right? Lacey. Oh, Steve Lacey. That's right. Yeah. Steve I used Lacey. to. Didn't Steve used to play some stuff with Mel Waldron? Didn't he? Was it Steve Lacey? Good Mel call. Waldron did a bunch of things. He played only soprano sax. Uh, right. But uh, lived a uh, yeah, better part of his later life. He lived in Paris. Uh, okay. He was famous for uh, when I first met him in Boston. Actually, he was uh, uh, his group uh, would play only music written by Thelonious Monk or songs that were arranged by Thelonious Monk. Oh, and that, that was his band. Uh, uh, really, an am amazing player, very, very experimental on his on his instrument, and, and that was uh, that was one of the sounds that David Sandboard had to, an absolutely unique sound. Yeah, you know, being used almost in pop and 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 blues. Sure. In fact, yeah. I remember David. Uh, Commiserating one night that he was afraid he was being overexposed, and he couldn't do what he he couldn't do what he wanted. That no, I want that Sanborn sound. No, don't play jazz. Do do that, do that. Do what you did with Butterfield, uh, uh, Arthur Blythe. It was uh, it was like listening to Cannonball. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, he yeah. had that, that same kind of you know, in your face energy that that Cannonball had looked a little bit like, shaped like him also mm -hmm. uh at howard uh, what, it, he was very creative with with the baritone sax but uh, he was not a section player he didn't he didn't play well that well in tune with the berry so, mm -hmm. so it, it was a it was a soulful flatness that was there uh billy harper had just come up from texas i think i think howard introduced him to gill also okay great player uh, very very soulful uh so uh, i don't know it, it, it's like sonny rollins in the middle of that i don't, I don't all, all of that uh yeah they didn't blend worth a damn and and, and gil didn't care he, 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 didn't care. he liked the way they played their soloing was was great uh, see that's just, just a mark of somebody truly unique yeah. uh who wants to well i i just find that all fascinating you know uh so that first gig, though, when Howard called you and you were making dinner and you went down to the Vanguard the first time with Gil. Yeah. So I'm just guessing you're probably sight reading the charts and all that stuff. What? Yeah. And of course, being a couple of master's degrees and reading was a thing. I mean, obviously, you were doing that a lot and jingles and everything else you're doing. You're probably reading constantly, yeah. right? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was a, a highly trained classical horn player at that time okay uh, i was uh, uh my plan was to when i get I was getting out of juilliard was to start auditioning for major symphonies mm -hmm. uh, and i got distracted by gil evans mm -hmm. that's quite I, a distraction right <laughs> i learned i learned something else uh, I, uh about my own instrument uh uh, French horn players, uh, how well you can relate to this, but generally the acceptable range uh, is up 
to a B-flat above the staff. Mm -hmm. C, but solid horn players have a high C. Okay. You know what? Uh, above that, Bach used to write above, way above the staff for that. But there was a, there was a different horn, a different model horn, which okay. actually played an octave higher. Oh. The, the guys who play Baroque who specializes in playing Baroque instruments. They use a different instrument for that, a different mouthpiece. Uh, on a conventional B flat F double horn, mm -hmm. you just don't play above the staff. You're asking for trouble. It's, uh, it's technically is you that you're so high in the overtone series that the notes are really close together. You can almost play, you can play a scale without using any valves. You put it okay. that way. Oh wow! Okay. So oh, you okay. just don't you just don't write up there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, nobody told Gil. <laughs> That's why I got the title. They would just, uh, there was that, uh, that, that moment I described where he just told the whole wind section, everybody, brass, woodwinds, everybody, everybody play up an octave. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at my part and I'm playing way above the staff. And I'm going, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I didn't want to say anything because you know these there are great players sitting all around me. I mean, mm -hmm. some of them famous, but uh, uh, some of them legendary. And I, I don't want to say I can't do it. I did it. You know, I just took a deep breath and I did it, and I I made it. Mm -hmm. uh, that night, my range increased by a fourth my upper oh, register. No kidding. Which of course it did. It it. It didn't. I always had it. It's just that it never occurred to me to try it because everybody said, "No, you don't want to do that." You don't do that. So I didn't, and that's that's what you learned in uh, at Juilliard. What you learned with the Gil Evans School of Music was just do it. Go for it. You just, don't have to tell it. my mom about that. She'll watch this. She, my mom will love uh, this because uh, for a lot of reasons. But uh, she used to tell me about the embouchure necessary to play French horn was also. A challenge for some people depending upon their lips their i mean i don't know the details on it but that mouthpiece is pretty small right generally it is it's, a, it's a, a close to the same size as a trumpet it's, it's a different uh uh the rim is a little thinner i think mm -hmm. uh, you're pushing a lot of air through those uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're on every instrument uh, not so much you, you need support Mm -hmm. breath support for all wind instruments sure. but not a lot not a lot of air going in uh, but okay not like a flute a f okay a yeah flute, that makes sense a flute takes more and more air than anything that that's mm -hmm. because there's not there's no resistance at no all resistance. You just okay, that makes across. sense what about uh, uh, you know the other uh, i'm sorry go ahead yeah no i was going to say the uh the embouchure is different the french horn I can remember it's been a long time. Uh, it's two thirds on your upper lip, one third in the bottom. Uh, trumpet is the uh, is the reverse. Oh, it's either equal or a third in the bottom. Okay. I don't know why. It just yeah. is. Something. You know, I, I, not that I should have known that. I feel like I should have, but I didn't know that. I had no idea. Nobody knows. Um, the other uh, my mom has still at home. She has her French horn from back in the day. Plus, uh, I think it's called a mellophone. Mellophone is a little different. Is she has, right. is she has one of those? Similar, similar shape to French horn, but uh, I think everything's different about it, right? As far as what key it's in. Is, you hold it the other way. And then valves work. And I think it was probably invented uh, for something for trumpet players to double on. Okay. Okay. Uh, because you work the keys with your right hand. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a guess. Uh, oh, that's right too because with the french horn i remember when i used to attempt to even get a note out of that thing it was left hand valves on a french horn right valve control okay right and then the other and those were like different uh because hers were more like trumpet valves on the mellophone i think uh, yeah yeah okay and i can't remember if there were three or four is it three three or four three, three, valves. three? Uh, okay an old friend of mine uh uh, I worked with for many, many years. He, he died uh, several years ago. Uh, but Don Elliott, uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. who was famous for playing mellophone. 
Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've, I've heard of him and know of him through Jeff Stockham here in town. Of course, Jeff has a huge horn collection too of every kind of brass instrument horn you can ah, think of. Huge. Mike Tavlin. Uh, oh. Don uh, was famous for a while uh, as a jazz musician. Uh, so he had uh, an endorsement with, with somebody. And a complaint about the, the mellophone is you play, you're, look, you're I'm looking at the audience, there you are, I'm playing like this, hands in the bell, bell's pointed that way. Yeah. Right. It should be that way. Don had them uh, rebuild a mellophone uh, for him, uh, where the bell, uh, the last, the final tube, instead of curving, it went straight out. Oh. Okay. And they, they named it the mellophonium. Okay. And, uh, oh. and that's that became Don's uh, instrument. So it's this huge round trumpet thing with this big flared bell uh, look, wow. looking forward. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's well. I I never really experimented experimented much with brass. I just wasn't too daring. I I do have a keyboard now, and I'm uh, starting to experiment there, but I need to start over. <laughs> so, of course, my way of experimenting is, well, it's my way. But I need to learn some actual things now, like remembering my scales and the different fingerings and this and that. But also just textures Hello. you know what i like is that the my father passed away it's gonna be five years i can't believe five years ago this august but he had a, a keyboard a yamaha something i don't know what it is so it's probably a good 12 13 years old but the thing about it is textures because the thing gets so many sounds you know it's not a low-end key but it's not a high-end key but at the same time i'm finding that some of these sounds are beautiful so i don't know but that's beside the point. Um, it is. Well, it, it isn't to me. Uh, but I got. I was fascinated uh, initially by synthesizers. Well, the mini Moog is what started it, because they could make sounds that nobody else could make. Right. Uh, and the same instrument, uh, it, it could go, could cover such a wide variety of sounds. A huge thing. Uh, it sounded extremely low, extremely high. Mm -hmm. uh, could slide from one pitch to another. They could make sounds that had no pitch at all. Sure. Uh, again, but during the seventies, I said I was bouncing from studio to studio all day with my mini moog a lot. But uh, uh, Star Wars came out in the mid seventies. Yeah. And right. and that was that, that that was big and uh, TV commercials, disco and Star Wars noises, and sometimes I would be brought in uh, to do either uh, electronic tom toms. Okay. So I would I would build a sound. Boo doo boo doo 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 doo. That was me. One fill, up a, you know, six notes, and that's it. I can pack up and go home. Another one might be if they needed a a laser shot, okay. or, oh, or yeah. a spaceship, a spaceship flyby. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. Any mode. It. I can only yeah, play one note at a time. I uh, I earned a living making screwy noises, beeps and barps and weenie weenies. I used to call them. That's, that's so uh, funny. So in the, I'm, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt, but the, on the Moog then, the mini Moog, uh, that's just one note at a time? That's yeah. it? Okay. I remember uh, the first time I saw one was with Chick Corea, Return to Forever. He had it up near the top and he kept on, you know, pitch changer and all that. Yep. And uh, it was a big deal, man. That Like everybody wanted the Moog. Yeah, it was uh, that, that uh, it's one of a handful of instruments that changed the music industry. Mm -hmm. It changed it completely. The uh, next keyboard, though, it was the Yamaha keyboard, I think around 1980. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Mini Moog uh, was analog synthesis, had been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Mini Moog got it down to where it was playable by the average guy. And once you figured out the knobs, which, which took a lot of figuring out, uh, you could predictably come up with a sound. Uh, 
and and it was affordable. I think at the time they were eighteen or nineteen hundred or something, something like that, or somewhere in that. Vicinity. I could be wrong about that, but uh, mm -hmm. somewhere in the two thousand dollar range, which okay. is a tremendous amount of money. This this is yeah, uh, this is in the seventies, like right, yeah, early seventies, forty five, forty five years ago. So yeah, uh, that's a lot of money back then. Yes, yeah, I did, I did it, and I, I paid pay for itself you know, doing laser shots and an electronic <laughs> that's, compound. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, I, I'm curious. Um, we, we can, we might just have to do part one today and part two another time down the road. I've, I've got a few of those I'll probably do because there's just so much that there's some people have just done so many things and it's so interesting. There's no way you're going to cover it in one talk even if you go for three or four hours it's just not going to happen but um i'm fond of saying i'm fond of saying that if you if you hang around long enough you get to do everything yeah that's true which is i make i may have done but it's well, it's I, all I mean, I you know, it's all great pages it's all great of, of bio and history on you and uh I've, I've been of course i've been reading this for about two weeks because i was getting ready for last week and then I've, I read more and I'm like, man, you know, you've got, oh, oh, so I was listening the other day to that album, Electric Outlet, John Schofield. And you're on that one. Was that the one with, uh, and I can't remember, was it Omar Hakim on, on that? Or who, who was on Electric oh, Outlet? No, Sanborn's on, uh, Steve Jordan might be on that. Steve Jordan, yeah. Steve Jordan. Oh, Rodney, and then, oh, Rodney Holmes, one of them. I think it's Steve Jordan because I remember that yeah. big fat snare drum sound that he gets, which I love, the rim shot. Uh, and I think Sanborn might be on that too. Uh, if it's I remember. Possible. Yeah. I haven't heard it in a long time. Yeah, that's a I'll tell you that's a cool album. Score was great. Score was great. There there's a guy too who, you know, all you have to do is hear maybe one note, but you know, a few notes and you know it's him because of the identity. It's, it's great, that unique voice, player. like hearing, you know, all the great players out there that he's one of the he's one of the people uh, went to uh, something I missed out on, but uh, went to the school of Miles Davis. Uh, there was a, a tour, the Far East tour. We were, we were supposed to be opening for Miles. It ended mm -hmm. up getting turned around the other way because Miles wanted to play early and then go out to dinner. Okay. <laughs> miles is miles. <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, the band at the time, I think it was Al Foster, Mino Sinalu, Tom Barney maybe was doing that tour. He had two guitar players, Mike Stern and John Schofield. Oh. And he, uh, I mean, both of them were wonderful. Uh, sure. Uh, Mike had been with, uh, with Miles for a little while. Wonderful, wonderful player. Uh, mm -hmm. He was. Uh, this was before Mike really got straight. Uh, got his, you know, got his life in in order. Yep, uh, I remember that too. I actually saw so the band. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, and he he did this a long time ago, and, it, and he, he did, and it was it was wonderful, and uh, it was uh, thrilling. Sure. For everybody who knew him personally, because he's such a such a great guy and a brilliant player, always has been. Uh, uh, as as we did we did this tour, Miles was was big about whoever soloing, just let him go. Mm -hmm. uh, but when Miles decided you soloed enough, he would just pick up his horn and start playing. Uh, that was so, it. That was the same. So I've heard. You just heard, heard that solo's people. over, motherfucker. That's it. Stop. <laughs> Stop playing. I, it, it went was week after week. Uh, uh, you know, Mike, Mike would play and Miles would let him go for a long time. Mm -hmm. and John would take a solo. Yeah, he'd play for like 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and Miles would cut him off every night. And John was, he didn't. What am I doing wrong? He's trying so hard. I love this band. This is my, this is the ultimate band. I want, I want this. I want this. Uh, it, it went on for for a couple of weeks, 
like every night if it was brutal to watch I uh, and then one night I don't know where we were somewhere in Japan we were hanging out in the bar afterwards John and I were drinking and uh, uh, talking to some, some English guys who were the English musicians but, and he got a message to come up a Miles manager wants to talk to you and if he if he oh geez that's it it's gonna it's gonna be a plane ticket handed to me and he got up he came down several minutes later he was just like Miles said he loves the way I play he, he's in the band I'm in the band and wow. and and he let Mike go because I uh, Ultimately, he was trying really hard to let, to give Mike a chance, mm -hmm. and Mike just you know clearly needed counseling and needed help, which he got. Uh, yeah, he did it, real well too. He did so well getting it together, and he is a nice guy. I don't know him very well, but you know he's always so sweet. Mike is. I, I so saw the band in uh, when I was living in Evanston for a couple of years. I moved out early '82. Uh, at Grant Park, you know, you, you probably played at Grant Park, but that was like a place where they'd have people, you know, Count Basie and, oh, uh, you know, McCoy Tyner with Tony, Ron and Freddie Hubbard. And I don't know, the list goes on. Miles was there. Is that where the, the Chicago Jazz Festival is? This is, um, that, so at the time, back in that, in that period of time, they usually had the festival on Navy Pier, but that's like, kind of like around the corner basically from grant park which is now millennium millennium park um but it was marcus miller mike stern al foster mino Sanello, and, and miles and uh I, I don't remember if there was a keyboard player there probably was but i don't know but any anyway, or there may not have been but Miles would go and prod on some keys every now and then miles but uh mike was man he just sounded so everybody sounded great and Al, of course, that's a guy I love the way he plays anything. You know, he's the groove meister, groovinator. Is that what Adam says? The groovinator? <laughs> Groovalator. 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 No matter what he plays, whether it's Miles' funky backbeat stuff or, uh, you know, I remember seeing him with McCoy Tyner too at once at the Regatta Bar in Boston. Wow. Uh, can't remember who else was on the gig, though. Just a trio. Maybe Charnet Moffat or somebody, but uh, but yeah, it was interesting because Mike also, you know, uh, of course, Mike. Not that you'll see this, but if you do see this, you know, we all love you. And 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 man, when he got it together, he got it together fast. He leaned up. He looked good. And man, it's just been a straight arrow since. Since then, he's just put out such beautiful stuff. Plays. I love how he plays, and he's a nice guy. He's a great guy, great guy, yeah. very, very special player. Yeah, and, and there's another one, you know, when it's Mike, when you hear Mike or Sko or, just, oh, there's Sko, there's Mike. Really, really neat. That's hard, that's hard to do. Uh, you create your own sound. I, I've never done that. Uh, it's not not something I'm, I'm destined to do. But, but I, I think of the people who have done that. And come back to Howard Johnson constantly is like, uh, uh, Howard is one of a small group of musicians uh, that I look at it that they change the way their instrument is played. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you stop and stop and think about it, that that's a really small group of people. Uh, Howard did you know, he was doing stuff on the tuba, you know, a jazz quartet, piano, bass, drums, and tuba. Who the hell's going? Nobody could do that. Nobody could play that stuff. Yeah, Howard did it. Howard did it, and then he'd be playing with the band, you know, doing, uh, uh you're know, doing uh, uh, the the band, uh, right? By uh, you know, backing Robbie Robertson, mm -hmm. and, and you'd hear Howard uh, that that thing he used uh, in the background where he could fit it in. Uh, I'll sing it. We put it with Yeah, two octaves coming out of a tuba. He yeah. called it the gorilla. Oh really? Uh, it was like a signature sound. It's on the recordings of the last walls. Uh, okay. He did it live all the time. Uh, he tried to do it with Paul Simon. Uh, Paul didn't like it, so that, that was the end of that. <laughs> so he <laughs> he toured with Paul too, huh? It, that, that band. Uh, I mentioned that it's a great a great gig. Uh, it was 
I think for a while I was calling it a musical Rolls Royce. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the band right. Howard uh, uh, George Young was a sax soloist. Ron Tooley uh, played trumpet. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, somebody else. Ah, Rath. Sorry, senior senior moment. Uh, anyway, my brother was playing bass. Steve okay. Gadd drums. Oh Eric wow. Gale. Eric, Eric Gale was playing guitar. Oh yeah. And and uh, one of my personal idols, Richard T, was playing piano. Yes. And really, yeah, I've backup the backup group was the Jesse Dixon and the Jesse Dixon Singers, a gospel group from Chicago, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that was the backup singers. Gee, that's uh, great. And it was, you know, I was, my job was to synthesize strings for the most part. Oh, wow, the stuff that's cool. that done on the album with occasional other thing. There was some organ stuff, not too much. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was the uh, utility. Uh, and I don't know which, whichever direction I wanted to look at at any moment. It was like one of my favorite players on the planet. I just get to watch him. Uh, yeah. Richard T with a with that big grin and just yeah you know, playing the class Richard was classically trained. Mm -hmm. like, he was a okay. good classical pianist and he got the gospel and the, the, and he stopped that. But you can see that in his, in his playing now. A lot of videos. Uh, he's doing the thing, you know, trilling between the fourth and fifth fingers. Mm -hmm. It's really tough. I can't do it. Oh Richard yeah, do it. that'd be. You know, that'd be... All these, you know, all these, uh, you know, all these, you know, octaves playing octaves, which is mm -hmm. very gospel to do. And he, just, he, everything Paul did, he just turned it into gospel as much mm -hmm. as he could. It was like, wow. And and Steve Gadd was like the model of the groove player yeah. of all time. And like, uh, uh, that, that that was a happy time. And after, for a long time, we toured all over the world, all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in small venues, which are kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Paul didn't want to play arenas for whatever reason, so we played fifteen hundred, two thousand seats theaters mm -hmm. you know, for months and months. It just kept going. And yeah, it was great. It was great. Uh, so the, those are my those are my experiences. But learning from all of them, learning from the people sitting next to him. Uh, uh, a lot of touring with my brother uh, in different organizations. Now we have a band together, which is great. Yeah. And, right. Yeah, yeah, Tony is uh, uh, technically by the numbers, he's my kid brother, but I learn from him every day. So, sure. most, and certainly every gig that we play. So, well, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've met your brother a few times, uh, all very brief, uh, except for the time, Malcolm Moore. Malcolm, how you doing, man? If you happen to see this, I'm sure you will. When we went to pick up the Cafe Crim which they used to use with King Crimson on stage and bring out that it had the espresso machine in it still and like old bags of coffee beans. And so we threw that in my car and then, uh, well, it is funny because the first thing we did, we went to Tony's house, that one on the corner I was telling you about, mm -hmm. and then he made us espresso. Then we went out, got the crim, went out to eat, and then we drove home. But it was fun because, uh, you, you know, one of my other things I find interesting, you talk about, learning from Tony, your kid brother, right? Well, my son, uh, I, I learned from my son all the time. I learned from my daughter all the time. I learned from my little sister all the time. And because there isn't anyone I can't learn from. I've been, you know, it, I'm kind of famous for going out in cities and just walking around. And I'll talk with people who apparently maybe don't have a place to live because I'll learn something. And sometimes it really changes my perspective on my life because of what they told me about their life. Yep. You know, whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. It, it's just, it's an experience. It's every learning from everybody is, uh, well, I can learn from any, there isn't anyone I can't learn from. And then the other thing I find interesting too, is I love to talk about music, music experiences, like we've been talking about today, which I love. I find that one of the most that's one of the most interesting things to me but it's also interesting the other conversations you get into about stuff you know if i talk with dave weckle 
we never talk about drums. We every time I see him, we talk about cars because we love cars. We're muscle car guys. I would talk with your brother. We talk about espresso. <laughs> yep. so, and uh, if it gets it's us just, together. It's just especially funny. if Leonardo is involved, it'll be bagels. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Uh, uh, that's the uh, the Levin Brothers band. Okay. Uh, which uh, initially was. Uh, 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 Tony and my, myself and Jeff Siegel and Eric Lawrence. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, four, four Jews and a manager, agent, who loves bagels, <laughs> and has tours all over the world and knows where to get the best bagels. That's uh, so I got cool. one in Buenos Aires. He knows where to go for bagels. Excuse me. I know a guy. I got a friend. He makes bagels. Uh, that's that's, that's great, man. Bagels. It's that's, funny whenever I go to New York, uh, which geez, now I haven't been there and probably a year and a half. I was going there a lot for my work uh, in the neuro rehab arena or or going there and hanging out for a day or two intentionally catch a show somewhere like uh, uh, Vanguard or wherever and then meet up with Leo, Leonardo and have coffee and bagels at, uh, I, I never remember the name of the place, but I when I went to London the first time years ago, I saw they, they're there too. So this is a Pret Amanger or something like that. Uh, the coffee shop, great bagels. So uh, that's that's great though. Wow. Um, so yeah, the Levin brothers. Um, you have. Well, what what are your plans with the Levin brothers? COVID aside, I mean, of course, we have to consider COVID. But any recordings in the works? Any projects? So we plan to be alive. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, it's uh yes we have thoughts no no plans mm -hmm. we came into we started we started touring and released the album in 2014 we started touring in 2015. Mm -hmm. it was pretty well received uh we're not doing big venues obviously but big clubs mm -hmm. uh yes yeah, low budget touring uh, we went to south america a couple of times went to canada went to japan uh a band like that, you know, a not famous jazz quartet. Uh, you're touring on a budget. If we're touring in, in this country, we're taking turns driving the van, schlepping our own gear. Exactly. Uh, and you have to work every night because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if it's not a good paying job, you take it. Because uh, mm -hmm. any night we uh, we don't have a gig. There's no money coming in, so we got to cover our own hotels and meals. Like, sure. Uh, so it's you're a bunch of old guys on the road, you know, you know, schlepping, doing it. It's okay. It's fun. But the uh, we did pretty well in 2019, uh, and finished the year. With, uh, of course, a lot of it has to be sandwiched in uh, between King Crimson tours. Sure. Because yeah. obviously Tony's got to get that. They pay a little bit better than the. 11 brothers yeah. <laughs> yeah he had a it seems like he had a busy schedule with crimson there for a while oh, yeah. Yeah. a couple of years they ago still, yeah. they still are they're, they're, mm -hmm. they had uh, hoped to tour this summer they, they can't it's just not practical uh, right so anyway we finished we did uh we did in the middle of the year last year and then we did i think three weeks in december mm -hmm. our touring our all northeast mm -hmm. uh, and then right into January, which took a few days off around New Year's, and kept going. Went all through January, up to Canada, Detroit, Chicago. Uh, you're at Canada in the middle of winter in January. Yeah, big, right. yeah. smart. But hey, hey you got to go where the gigs are. This week. And we ended up back in Kingston. So we did a concert there, and then uh, drove about an hour and a half away, and finished the last gig on the tour was uh, in Pauling, New York. If you have any okay. idea where that is. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm very familiar. Uh, yes. Great club. Daryl's house. It's great. Uh, it had been a different club, and Daryl Hall bought it. I uh, sunk a lot of money into it. So mm -hmm. The kitchen is, is great. The food is great. He put in uh, his own production staff. Probably the guys that toured with him, his sound crew, which made sure they were working. 
So uh, we built the sound system, put in a complete video system. Oh, great. That was, the last, that was the last gig in two months of touring, and we recorded it. Oh, uh, good. Inc including video. Uh, and I've, I've actually just finished editing it now. Oh, great. And, and yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of that place. You know, it could be that Leonardo tagged me on a post that you were going to be there because he usually tags me on a lot of things, which I love because then I get to keep up with things. I don't want to miss anything. And that's another situation where I wanted to come down, but I, I think I was traveling somewhere doing my work. Uh, I don't know where. Could have been anywhere. No, that's a hole. Mm -hmm. It's a hole. Yeah, yeah but I hear it's great, though. It's a classic place. It's a really good club. It's a, but uh, what, two months? That was the best sound in front on one stage and the yeah. best sound we we had on all that i've oh. played there with other groups uh one i was doing for a little while a steely dam cover band the jerry Murata. oh was, yeah right jerry, mm -hmm. jerry and rick Murata both playing in it uh and i got there with the sound set up i realized i needed uh i needed in-ears uh i have in-ears i brought them i didn't have an amp uh, okay. And they said, oh, "Don't worry about it. We'll fix you up." And they just went back, dug through the, oh, dug great. through the shell, came back out with a high-end, you know, clip-on amplifier for me, wireless rig. Oh, good. But the club nice. is set up that way because Daryl plays there occasionally, and, mm -hmm. and he wants it to be totally together. And it is a great crew. And they recorded us live, multi-track, mm -hmm. uh, and the recording is, is good. So uh, I've rough mixed and edited. The oh, whole thing. yeah. I'd like when that comes out, I'll be in line to get that. Yeah. So, so our, our plan, our plan uh, we had three offers for this year, Europe, the Far East and South America. Mm -hmm. And all of it, all of it trashed. We had, we had to So we, we might Northeast again. Maybe we'll get to Syracuse. Uh, you know, I was, we, I was we might try in the fall. Uh, yeah, I mean, not, I would not before then. I would love it if you got here. Um, you might have. Did you play here at uh, the Lost Horizon? Do you happen to remember if maybe you did that venue? Or there's an Auburn Public Theater in Auburn, which I saw Frank Gambelli there a couple of years ago. Um, but also uh, Water Water Street Music Hall in Rochester is another one that has, like, I, I know. Stickmen's played at least not not Auburn, but I've seen Stickmen a few times. Uh, well, we opened for them in a couple of places, yeah. Water Street. So, do you know, were you in Syracuse on that tour a year and a half ago or so with uh, with uh, Levin Brothers? Yes, oh, yeah, because I feel like you were here and I wanted to go, but I was about out of the country or something, probably again. I don't remember where we played, but I get I get the venues mixed up something. Auburn, I know very well. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a good friend of mine, bass player, uh, uh, Peter Tomiko. Uh, no, uh, Peter McCulowitz. I'm oh, sorry. Peter oh, Mack. Peter Mack. I know yeah. Peter Mack. Yeah. Yeah. He's great uh, oh, he's a great player. We we did uh, one, gig, one gig together. I'm sorry. I, it was David Castiglione, Peter, and me. And it was a beautiful gig. It's the only time I ever worked with him, and it was it was a blast. He's great. He's a cool guy. A cool yeah, guy. I love him because he's self made millionaire. He is and humble about it. Just a great guy, and like, what can, what can I do for you? He's really really good and a good player too. So, uh, anyway, yep. he's a uh, he's a patron of that theater. Uh, and uh, it's funny Leonardo had called the theater to try to get us in there because I knew the theater very well. I played mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And it, well, I don't know, eleven of jazz, nah, maybe not. So I, I shamelessly called Peter. <laughs> it's a Peter. Can you hook us up? It's and like, bang, we were we were in. Oh, great! Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Peter's. Uh, I forget his business though. I know he has an art something. He's involved in art, right? Works he has a art. factory. If I followed it completely, it's the factory that prefabricates store interiors okay i think that uh, he may have an art gallery or two or something like that uh, like that could, could very well be and he races yeah. cars uh, oh he does oh i yeah. got i gotta learn about that because I, I, I love cars I just, i've never i hope if he sees this i hope it's not embarrassing him but it's a pleasure to see somebody who makes money is humble about it 
is into sharing and it's just you know he spends the money not not to show off but just it just to put himself in a nice place and his family in a nice place and his friends sharing with his friends and his family yeah. all over the place and with the community you know the so fact he's that, very that philanthropic he, yes mm -hmm. the, the auburn theater might not exist if not for peter and it, he just makes it happen I, I guess all he wants back is i want to do a gig there every once in a while so exactly so, which, that's that's peter he's a great guy really great yes guy. Yeah, I wish I, you know, wish I had been able to work more with him. It just didn't, you know, how cr paths don't cross with some people ever, sure. or, or maybe seldom. But I'll never forget the gig. It was at Swaby's, Swaby's Pub, which is a big pub in Auburn, an old, beautiful place. They have a stage. We just went and we just did our thing, man. And I had like, it was a great gig full of. Well, I, I will say it was, uh, we could all be expressive because of the personalities, especially with Dave Casty there playing. Uh, he encouraged to be yourself. And it, you know, I really learned a lot from Dave. Dave, if you see this, I miss your brother. We got to get together because we just do. But uh, we had a lot of great moments on that gig. Wow. And good beer too. <laughs> so, um, well, you know, I had there's another thing I wanted to ask you too. I was I wrote down some notes. I think though, what would be good. I'm sorry I'm moving around here. What happened is in the middle of this, my chair broke. And so uh -huh. uh, I'm just shifting from knee to knee. Yeah, the chair oh. I oh, knew dear. it was about it, it had about ready to leave this world and now it's ready for the fire pit. <laughs> I'll bring in my drum stool next time. That 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 thing's old and good. So what I was thinking is, we should do this again, uh, and maybe just continue. How would you feel about that? That's, that's fine. I me. have a lot of questions. Yeah. I have questions, more questions about Paul Simon, Lenny White, Lou Soloff, uh, Jimmy Guffrey, uh, oh. Eleven Brothers, just other stuff too. It'd be really fun to hear about those experiences and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff too. I would love to. Especially when you when you list people like that that are re really close to my heart, uh, Tony obviously, but uh, sure, uh, Danny Gottlieb. We, we talked about Lou Soloff. Was, well, I mean, oh, losing yeah. him was was huge. Uh, yeah, but the, there are some uh, uh, there are some local drummers here. You you might want to talk to. Or we could talk about. I uh, uh, I know I was going to say I know better, but it it would be not logical for me to say, here's my favorite drummer. I don't have one. It depends mm -hmm. on where you are and what you're playing. Uh, no, I don't just, have one either. And I'm a drummer. Not. I have many though. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what you're, what you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, like Steve Gadd is a, he's, he's tremendous, but uh, I've heard him, you're playing straight ahead gigs that, you know, he, sound, he sounds, yeah, he sounds good, but it doesn't, it didn't feel quite right to me. It, uh, like another, like an Al Foster would have been, would have made it different. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, like somebody else who, uh, again, a very, very close friend of mine uh, and and neighbor, uh, who's uh, famous for locking down a beat is Jerry Murata. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. He was, he was great and very tired of people. He's got, I think I got stories. He, you could go all day with Jerry, but he's <laughs> a great guy, very funny, but he's a very, very special drummer. Right? Yeah. Just, you know, this, the stuff he, going back to the, you know, the stuff that he created for Peter Gabriel, uh, in, you know, that, that first band with, with Tony and uh, 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 David, uh, guitar player. Um, ah. I forgot he'll come back i'm sorry dear so, anyway and jerry but they created a lot of those grooves together uh, uh yeah uh, he's, uh... It, 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 he's still doing that long list of pop players that he's played with it for me playing with jerry the groove just locks in so perfectly it's like you can do anything over him because that's always going to be right there um uh, uh jeff siegel uh is a He's been doing, uh, Jeff has been doing small, small group things for many years. He played with a iconic 
the pianist uh, Lee Shaw, a wonderful lady who died just a, few, just a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, oh, well, uh, things are things are escaping me. But he, again, he's got a long resume of, of like uh, sure. uh, mostly smaller groups. A tr tremendous jazz player, and he is officially one of the Levin brothers. He's been with us f since the beginning. Oh, that's great. Uh, he is also uh, a yeah, creative. He's a straight-ahead drummer, and he does that very well. And we've pulled him into doing. Uh, now, as our repertoire shifts over the years, we're doing uh, prog rock pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's cool! From, from King Crimson and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in other other sources, uh, that kind of groove is that's not what Jeff specializes in. So he puts his own twist on it. And obviously, we're playing jazz. There's no vocals. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we're putting our own twist on, uh, uh, like King Crimson, Sleepless. And we, oh, we, sure. But we do it our way. There's instrumental soloing. Uh, uh, I brought in a chart derived from Gil Evans' version of uh, of Up From The Skies, Jimi Hendrix. Oh, we wow. do that. Tony's, yeah. Tony's playing the melody on bass. Uh, yeah. And uh, our, our guitar player at the time, uh, Jeff Champa, Said, ah, oh, Hendrix, and he pulled up a wah wah pedal, and I tell him, no, you know, don't you know, don't do that. It needs to do it. Does. You know, like a big band, uh, it needs, yeah, do that, and we'll just lock into this groove, and Tony will be do do it, do it, do it over it. It's right. so, uh, another guy, another guy you should meet, not very well known. His name is Ken Lovelet. Uh, He's an old friend of mine, go 40, 45 years we go back. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth uh, moved up to Woodstock years ago, 30 years ago, I think. Uh, he's an unusual drummer. Uh, it, uh, he had ideas about percussion instruments, modifying drums. Mm -hmm. uh, and he started building them in his shop. He's a good builder. Uh, it, uh, it, at this point, he copped uh, the company name American Percussion. Okay. And, it, and at this point, he has a huge line of custom-made drums, drums yeah. he's invented. Is uh, he near, does he live around you anywhere? Is he, where's he located? Yeah, he's like 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> that, that's it. Way off in the woods. Uh, uh, the instruments... Uh, then we get off. I'll email you a link to him. But you should, well, you should talk to him. Oh, at, I'd love uh, to. Yeah. If he's got a way of doing it. Maybe if he can take you out into a shop and show you some of these instruments, which uh, uh, a typical. He he figured out how to build really good snare drums. They're in. Uh, they're laminated. There's the circles of wood, and they're laminated. Okay. Uh, indestructible. Uh, and he gets. He buys the hardware. But the, and then he'll do unusual stuff, like he'll put a second snare inside the drum. Oh. Uh, or he'll come up with a model where uh, he'll cut holes, uh, slice holes all the way around the rim and mount tambourine jingles in them. Oh, wow. So the drum, yeah. the snare drum, becomes a huge tambourine. And then he went beyond that and built an entire drum kit and every element of the drum kit is a tambourine, including the bass drum. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, just, you know, just jingles all, or, all around it. Uh, yeah, I'd love to talk with him. That would be fun. It, it's, it's just reinventing percussion uh, stuff. You got a dumbek, uh, all uh, made of ceramic, uh, but it has a second coming of it. So it was a calfskin head on the main head where you play mm -hmm. on it. And there's another tube ceramic tube coming out of it with a smaller calfskin head on it oh, you can wow. play on that too or you can play on the main head and press on the other one to tune the main head while you're playing okay. well that's pretty you, clever you, you could do it all day with it yeah if you're ever down this way you should go out and visit him it, oh, he'll absolutely. stop what he's doing and give you a tour. you'll flip uh, i would do that he loves showing people he's, i'd love to actually he, just he's selling he's selling drums all over the world now so Gee, that's great. Doing, doing very well. So. Yeah, I'd love to do that and talk with him. That would be great. Uh, you know, I've, 
I see as a part of my reemergence into music at some point soon, as I've said before, something different, uh, including the instrument itself, what maybe even what instrument I choose, I'm sure that there will be drums, percussion involved, but uh, I'd also like to experiment with some different sounds. And, you know, not that I ever exploited the drum set because I certainly, I don't think anyone ever could. Like even Elvin Jones was saying to somebody, I don't even think that any human being has even exploited the snare drum thoroughly yet. And I think he's right because there's so many things you can do on any instrument, but I'd like to branch out a little different sounds, timbres, textures, based on uh, what I'm hearing in my head that I'd like to put out there. And you have something, what do you got? I just realized this is, uh, Ken, Ken gave me this. It's one of his, his smaller models. It's a, the drum. Oh. Wooden, wooden heads. Nice. And he, had, he makes whole drum kits where all the heads are wooden. No and this one, cool. you, pull, you can, I, uh, Oh, that nice. I'm not very good at that. that that's Cam. Beautiful. That's his mind. Well, uh, yeah, please do email me with. Uh, his, hat, hat his, okay. Oh, that's nice. Right. Yep. But yeah. You, gotta, like you, gotta, with you, can, you, can, you can get down here. Just you right. spend a day with him. Yeah, well, it'd be great sure. to even just get out of Syracuse for uh, the first time in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a COVID uh, calamity, the COVID penitentiary. But I mean, I, I love where everything's cool here. It's just, I'd like to get out and see another human uh, yeah, I know in the music mean. business. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, cool. I don't want to go that far. <laughs> the, you know, that's, but yeah. it would, that's cool. I like that innovation, you know, the innovative yeah. qualities. Yes. So Which I've always been involved in. Uh, through the 70s, as I was playing on a lot of commercials, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of TV promotional projects, whole packages of them sometimes. And I did very well. I, 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 was, I was making money. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, I was always working within boundaries, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more often than not with uh, people supervising me who were not musical at all. Uh, uh, we used to joke about a request I got once from an agency guy, could you play at an octave faster? <laughs> it, it, it like the rest of us in the room trying to keep a straight face, but it was. That's a good uh, one. That, that's that's good one. But th that there was, you know, I was earning a living and I was, uh, you know, I was, you know, paying the mortgage on my apartment and, uh, you know, 350 a month to keep my car off the street. And, uh, and overall it, it wasn't, the money-making things were not, not what I was enjoying. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed uh, uh, the pressure got lifted off when I moved out of Manhattan up to Woodstock. Uh, it's been uh, 18 years, 18 mm -hmm. years of summer. Uh, okay. I took the financial pressure off because mm -hmm. my nut went way down. Uh, yeah. But uh, it was the creative stuff uh, that made me feel good. And I got a lot of my arranging I did. I was primarily an, an arranger. Uh, for a lot of these, uh, working for production companies, uh, okay. Uh, sometimes a lot of electronics that I would, you know, crank up a single ear and, and play many parts. But a lot of times, you know, I was just arranging for orchestra, studio orchestra, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, uh, it was, you know, I do that during during the day, then go out and play and, and play uh, at Sweet Basil's that night or, or something. Sure. It was the live gigs. That's where I was getting my ideas from. Yeah, the inspiration. Sure. From, yeah. Or the yeah. people that would, <clears throat> excuse me, the people who would sit would sit in with us. Uh, right. Uh, uh, one one of those uh, with Gil, we were, we were playing Sweet Basil. I think Chuck Mangione sat in with us. It was interesting. Uh, it, it was not his kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But he sold it, played very, Chuck was very underrated. I think he was a very good, very good Trump player. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I ended up touring with him on his big orchestra tours. I was uh, oh. mostly Rochester students of uh, mm -hmm. filling out the big orchestra. Uh, but he brought ringers in from New York City uh, mm -hmm. who were just more experienced and players. Uh, 
and I got to know Chuck and respect him very, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, uh, I got off on a tangent, but it was these live things uh, that inspired me. Sure. Uh, even the gigs with, with Chuck, which were like, you know, it was like an orchestra gig with a rhythm section. Yeah, uh, I have some of those recordings. I actually have on vinyl, I have some it's a pretty good great. size orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. He could afford to do that. You know, we played to large auditoriums. We traveled mm -hmm. some. Uh, I think the last tour is uh, Land of Make Believe tour, I think. And yeah, it was yeah. a chorus. Uh, and, and singers, solo singers. It was, it was, it was pretty amazing. But, uh, he did it. He did well. We played Carnegie Hall, I think, with, with that. Uh, but even from that, I would learn. Uh, oh, sure. I mean, Chuck, uh, not a trumpet player, he played flugelhorn, which right. is a treacherous instrument. Sure. Uh, it's nice and mellow. It's a great sound. Uh, you get into the high register, it doesn't behave like a trumpet does. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more difficult. It's tricky to get into play in tune getting to the note to come out that you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. Not all that easy. Sure. And Chuck would do it and just make it seem effortless. But there was one one piece, uh, The Hill with the Lord Hides. Okay. Uh, it was, I probably you know, know it. I just not good with titles, but I'm sure I know that one. It was, yeah. hit. it was one of his hits, not 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 a chart climber, but it was, it was a hit record. Uh, it starts with uh, a trumpet cadenza. Okay. Not improvised. It was a, it was carefully worked. It was written, mm -hmm. uh, and Chuck was on the podium conducting. He would turn around, face the audience. So we were in the Kodak Theater in, in Rochester. Yep. He's looking at two thousand people. There's three hundred people behind him on stage, just sitting, twiddling our thumbs, and Chuck, all by himself, would play this cadenza, which started medium, it went higher, and it went higher, it went really high, and then came down and settled. He played that for at least one long tour. I never clammed the note. Wow. I, I was just, you know, perfectly in tune. He would just play it, put it about out of it, he'd end on a note, put one in a turn around, and give us a downbeat, and we're rocking. Uh, you can't not respect him as a brass player. He's, oh, he's sure. a fine, fine player, fine musician and writer, of course. Mm -hmm. But he's a good horn player. Good, really good. And I learned from that, just watching him. Mm -hmm. Just as you're on stage, just it takes confidence, which I'm still trying to scrabble together <laughs> in my 90s. So I'll feel better about it. Uh, just watching Chuck, that, that's what he does. And he, and he just did it. And that, that's, a, that's a really important for, I think, for all musicians to, to get that confidence and yeah. to feel good about yourself. You, you know, mean? I think the first time I ever heard you that I am aware of might have been on a Gap Manjone album. Could did, be. did you record with Gap early 70s? Mid 70s? Would have been a long time ago. Yeah. Because yeah. actually, there's another album I have with Gap, and I can't remember. Uh, my dad got it for me. And I remember where I lived. So, yeah, we, I was probably 15 at the most. So, 1976 or so. And it was your brother, Steve Gadd, and Gap, the trio. No, wait, wait. I'm sorry. No. That's the first time I heard Tony. That's right. That I knew of anyway. So it might, might have been early were, 70s, but no. They you, were doing, you, that, trio. They were doing yeah. that trio in a hotel bar in Rochester. I saw them there. Really? Oh, my gosh. No, it's There's, a long time uh, ago. There, there is one, a uh, sing-along junk. What is sing-along junk? That's Gap. But you're on that. It could, it could, it could be. It Wait, you know, time. the uh, thing is, is so uh, now I've recorded, uh, I've been on maybe 25 CDs in my life. I don't remember which ones I'm on. I can't tell you all. If you've done hundreds and hundreds, you can't remember all of them. So I don't hold you like responsible for remembering. <laughs> but this some of the my... ones that are successful, ones that are successful, you remember, or well, the ones that you particularly enjoy. Yeah, uh, sure. This, I just want to show you. This is my chair. That's the other. That's one ah. half. Yeah. So that's what was going on here. <laughs> if it's not, if it's not a cancellation wow. for feeling sick, it's falling off of your chair in the middle of an interview. 
but uh, hey, I'm getting a different postural workout right now. But yeah, um, well, I would love we to do a, this. A oh, What's that? I'm sorry, I was, was going to launch another story. Oh, it's just going to say uh, I'd love to do oh. it again, but but please, yeah, keep going. I don't have to go right away. Oh, yeah. I'll, 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 yeah. So at some point, you got to wave stop. Uh, it's a concert in Tokyo with Gil Evans. Uh, uh, Gil was oblivious to the audience, what was going on. Uh, there was never a set list. 16 years, never a set list. Uh, 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 Gil would, would finish the tune. Gil would sit and think for, for, uh, for a minute, maybe. He'd just start vamping the song. Because mm -hmm. we all knew the, the book really well. We would scramble, get that music, and eventually it would, we'd get it started. That's the way it was like. But he was oblivious to what was going on around him, only the sound and the texture of the band. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he would hear something's going on, somebody's solo, it would be a background chorus, an ensemble chorus he wanted to bring in. And he would stand up and he would just, like this, and he would conduct, give us a big downbeat, then he'd sit, he'd sit back down at the piano and go back, go back to playing. And we're watching him. Gil, what? What is it you want us to do? He didn't tell us. There was no <laughs> signal, no letter, and it, 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 so we, of course, didn't do it. It, it's almost like he didn't notice. It's like he felt he wanted that at that time. Uh, didn't happen. No big deal. Something else will, will happen. So anyway, we're playing this concert in Tokyo. Uh, it, a very formal kind of theater. I don't know, I know the side, at least a thousand seats, probably mm -hmm. more uh, indoors. And we played and we played. Gil was obviously also oblivious about uh, time, how long we played. Another small story. You're going to need five hours with me. But yeah. <laughs> That's why we'll do playing, part two. We're part playing at Car Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carnegie Hall. We're just we've, we're somewhere set up been going for two and a half hours, and I was set up kind of near Gil, and Gil looks up at me, says, "Pete, we play an hour yet?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." And I'm, lo I'm looking at in the wings as stage guys going, you know, you know like this. Oh, Gil, I think they want us to stop. So, I, so we did another tune, and we're, anyway. They'll never, never let us back in there again. Uh, so we're in Tokyo. Gil is oblivious to the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, they don't think that way. It's like, oh, okay, they're supposed to play whatever it was, seven to nine, that's it. Uh, also important because in Japan cities, the subways are stopped running at a certain hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people... You have to, if you you're doing something, home. you got to get out. You got to get to the subway. You can't get home. Right. So, uh, uh, so we finished a tune. Again, we'd been on stage for a couple hours, at least. Big band, huge band. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they just pushed a button and the curtain came down. <laughs> it was, again, big, big curtain, huge stage. Electric curtain just came down. Mm -hmm. But Gil didn't even see it. He started vamping another song and we're like gil gil is not yeah. he didn't know we just started waiting for what the hell he's he's the leader we're working for him we picked up with him we played the tune i think we're maybe on the third or fourth soloist apparently the, uh, they lowered the curtain and the fuse blew we were told afterwards which might have been bullshit but uh, yeah. we've been playing like for 15 minutes the curtain finally went up the whole audience was there. Nobody had left. Nobody had moved. We got wow. a huge ovation. Oh, wow. uh, and, and Gil, and he just he didn't notice. He, we finished the tune. He looks around. Oh, it's an audience. And he's like, this is the way he would end up. That was that's, a, that's a great story. I recorded, man. recorded that concert. Because mm -hmm. I had been shopping in Tokyo, and I bought a high-end stereo cassette deck. Mm -hmm. Cassette deck. Remember when this? Yeah, I, was, I remember uh, those. Yeah, I remember reel to reel, then cassette. Yeah. I I borrowed a couple of microphones from the sound crew. Uh, I set them up. All I had was my monitor mix. I asked for some adjustments on my monitor mix, uh, and I recorded the whole show. 
with this special moment in the end. Uh, and I brought it home. I listened to it. I th and I, you know, I talked to Gil and, and to his, his wife at, at, the, at the manager at the time. I said, you know, we should release this somehow. And we're listening to it. Uh, for some reason, I didn't have any bass in, in my monitor. So uh, the production house that I was doing freelance work for at the time, I asked if I could use the studio, transferred the whole thing onto multi-track, mm -hmm. but my stereo tracks. Jeff Berlin had done the concert in Tokyo. Oh, okay. I had Jeff, I had Jeff come in. He replaced the entire thing, <laughs> I, the, the entire bass part for the whole show. I, I remixed it. I got a different, uh, decent uh, mix out of it mm -hmm. and tried to sell it. Uh, uh, you know, they're taking it to companies with with Gill's permission. Uh, and I don't know, this was maybe a year after we had actually done the show. Mm -hmm. I pick up Downbeat, the record reviews, and I see I see a review of you know, Gil Evans of Japan. Uh, you know, a lot of blurb, a lot of bourbon, and, and, and Pete Levin took a great solo. And, I, and I'm going, you know, I don't think I've, I've done a lot of Gil's recordings, but I don't think I've taken a solo on any of Gil's records. What the hell is this? It was that concert. They bootlegged it from out front, no kidding. gave it to a record oh, label, wow. and, and they released it. <laughs> oh, wow. man. Oh, man. So that was life on the road. Uh, the musicians to, oh, keep yeah, us, to keep us poor, so I'll have to keep playing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good stories, though. That that's really funny about Gil. That he was oblivious to audience and never in time too, right? He didn't no. know if you're playing no. an hour or three hours. I pointed that out to Gil. His reaction to it. This is a little off color. Uh, uh, we have a G rating on this. Uh, it's yeah, no, we don't. No. Oh, okay. Uh, it's whatever. Of, Gil would come out with a wise saying every once in a while. So I showed him. I gave him my copy of the thing. I showed him that. Uh, and he, he said, Pete, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the fuckers and the fuckies. <laughs> we are the fuckies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh that, man. That's it. I've never forgot that. No, you, you can't. That's that's classic. Uh, you know, I have a real good, one of my best friends lives in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire area. And uh, he really was went through a long, long time where being into Gil Evans, um, probably, I'm sure he still is too. Um, I'll have to ask him what he's been listening to lately. But the other thing, I'm going back a little bit in our conversation, but his uh, PhD, his uh, dissertation, if you will, was on Thelonious Monk. It was up at Northwestern, uh, my, my friend was. Actually, I lived in Evanston too at the same time. So it got a real good education about Monk in the early 80s and Steve oh. Steve Lacey because I think maybe that may have been a time where he was doing the duo thing and doing Monk songs. It was all Monk related. And uh, that's why I learned about Steve Lacey too. It was through my friend Tom. So Gil's story, he'll appreciate Gil's stories. Uh, he'll love it. That's funny. What an institution, though, right? What a learning experience for 16 years with Gil and all the other people in the band, too, because you're with, like, so many a talented very people. That's great. Incredible people came through yeah. the band. I mean, not just great players, but I'm sure great people, too. You know, Howard, I never knew Howard. We just communicated a little bit. But I all all I've ever heard were was what a great person he was and what a great talent. Very you special. Know? Yeah. Special, very gentle. Uh, mm -hmm. very funny great player mm -hmm. great player and he said he changed the way his instrument is played which uh, that short list louis armstrong sure. uh, miles mm -hmm. uh, bill evans i think uh, uh coltrane probably, probably but very very few people and they're great players but they just they just kept they just kept the genre going and did mm -hmm. wonderful things mm -hmm. but to, to really change the sh I get, uh bill of fleck i guess uh you know, so, yeah and i i was uh i remember when i lived in uh 
Evanston, I would go shopping at these record stores when vinyl was a thing, right? And I would walk out of these stores with a lot of the cutouts. There were a lot of great blue note cutout albums, but there were also a lot of uh, relatively yeah. affordable things. And I remember picking up an Arthur Blythe thing with Howard. So basically Howard was the bass player on it, playing tuba. Yeah. And he does solos. I still have it. I've got it. It's Arthur Blythe. It's downstairs. Uh, I can't remember who else is on it. I, I feel like it could be Jack DeJanette, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I have to go look now. But that, that was my first introduction, though, to Howard Johnson was on an Arthur Blythe recording. So it's almost 40 years ago. Yeah. Interesting. Man. And the paths that you've all, the, the way the paths cross, like I had no idea that David Sanborn worked with Gil Evans, uh, but it took quite a while. Interesting. Wow. Well, so here my proposal is we do part two at some point in the uh, near future and uh, keep keep going. We can communicate maybe on uh, some highlights, but we want to maybe what you'd like to talk about. But I've really sure. enjoyed this today. I don't want to go, but I actually have to go soon <laughs> to oh, do sure. something with my wife. You got to pee. That, no, no, I actually don't. <laughs> Usually oh. I do. No, my wife and I have something we're going to do. Uh, well, it's, I can't go see funny. anybody. Oh. I'm happy but, uh, it was very enjoyable. And so I, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I found uh, that, as I know many people have for the last several months, of just realizing I haven't talked to this, this is a good friend. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Let me just call, and you end up you end up yeah. chatting for an hour, whereas you never did that when you were, when you were busy. Uh, yeah, I found that too. There have been some gifts with this situation, and I, I have to approach it like that too I, because. I yeah, just uh, some things. You have to get creative and start doing something before you lose your mind, you know? Um, and also, you, but, never, you never know. You might, you might be talking to somebody and they might be gone in two weeks. Oh, uh, you know, and that's another thing, too. It, it is pretty scary right now. Mm -hmm. It's It's frightening right now in some ways. And you just never know. But um, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to sign off, but I'd like you to stay on with me for just a second afterwards. Pete, thanks, man. Thanks for joining. Pleasure. Really had a really, great time. I enjoyed, I enjoyed this very much. Cole. It's good. Well, me too. I it's, you it's, uh, it's oh, no, no. I uh, I don't know if you know Steve Hunt up at Berkeley. He played a lot with Alan Holdsworth and uh, keyboard player. We went four hours one night and you know what? It was like a Gil Evans situation where I was Gil Evans. I had no clue. I looked and it was three and a half hours. Like, Steve, I probably ought to go to bed. Talk another half an hour. <laughs> Cause it was like two in the morning when we got done, but you know what? It was great. It was just fun. It was, I learned a lot. We, you know, got to, I got to communicate with somebody who I've admired for a long time. Like I am with you and uh, you, you know, I usually don't have a time frame, a, a, a length time, time max on these. So, but we'll do part two. We have lots more to talk about. Okay. That'll work. Good, good. So we'll I'll sign get... off. Uh, you stay with me. Don't leave yet. Uh, thank you again, Pete, for being here. And for people who are watching and listening, really appreciate you joining in. I know I had a great time. It's just so great to learn and document parts of history, if you will. And, you know, just talk about so many different things. So this has been great. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Be safe out there, too. Okay. So, uh, no, you know what? I, I don't, I know what I, I'm used to doing it a different way. So I'm just going to hit the.